What's up guys, my name is Jimmy House. Today I'm gonna to teach you some of the key elements of the sumo deadlift that I use to cheat my way to an 815 pound deadlift. So what we're gonna do is talk about the elements of maintaining a hip wedge, how to get that wedge, maintaining hip height, and how to get as vertical as possible while implementing the factor of patience off the floor, which in my case was the biggest transition in going from a 765 conventional or 740 conventional at 200 pounds to sumo where I was trying to explode really hard off the floor with my conventional. When I try to carry that to sumo, I found out that it's really not the same. In regards to the argument that sumo is cheating to conventional, I don't necessarily disagree, but the biggest thing that helped me mentally was equating it as an entirely different lift. So whereas conventional, I'm trying to explode off the floor and I use, generally use speed to dictate how well the lift is going. For sumo, it's a little bit of the opposite in the sense that you wanna implement a element of patience off the floor, being willing to invest two to three seconds off the floor in order to have a clean proportional lockout. And that's what we're gonna show and discuss today. So like I said, recently I deadlifted 815 on a Kabuki bar in preparation for the American Pro where I will be utilizing that bar. But today we're actually gonna be using a power bar, which is generally known as the much more stiff bar to act as a little bit of a deficit, but also to help to further help hone in on the patience that I need off the floor in order to lift heavyweights come the time of the American Pro in October. So let's get started. So in general, External rotation of the hip is gonna be your best friend. And I haven't pulled sumo very consistently. There's been times in my lifting career where I have done it more than others, but I've never actually committed to it. So this would be my first like two months of really taking it seriously. And in those two months, I really don't think I've gotten much stronger, but what I do think is that taking the time to invest and in really learning the technique and getting that repetition allowed me to take my you know, old deadlift max from a conventional 765 to a sumo 815 in a short amount of time just by implementing the technical cues. So when you see a lot of people do sumo, you have the people that do a little bit more of a, fro a frog stance, which is like more narrow and toes more straightforward to get the shorter range of motion of a sumo but to get the element of quad and upper back drive from a conventional, so it's kind of like a hybrid. Whereas for me, I'm taking advantage of my hip mobility, my ability to externally rotate my hips and get very, very close groin to the bar, which allows for a very upright torso position from the start to the finish. And really, the more that you can mitigate your you being bent over the bar here is gonna equate to a much cleaner lift. In fact, one of the cues that really helped me is this little triangle that occurs here. If you can get that as small as possible at the start of the lift, you're guaranteed to have a very good position to maintain throughout the lift. Whereas a lot of times when you rush it or you don't wedge your hips in properly, this triangle right here is really big, basically means your hips are far away from the bar and it becomes more of a grind to pull through and get up. Whereas if I start upright and that triangle being as small as possible, you see it's really just a matter of me locking out my quads and squeezing my glutes. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Now, the other part of that is when it comes to a sumo deadlift, a lot of times people will squat a little bit too low or they'll sit back too much. So you'll see, one second. You'll see a lot of times that when trying to get the hang of sumo, somebody will either squat too low like this or they'll just sit back too much like this. It's really a counterbalance between the weight and your hips where, yes, you're using the weight to keep you from falling backwards, but you're also trying to shove your hips to the bar as opposed to sitting down below it or sitting too far behind it. So the difference is from the side, this would be sitting too low, this would be sitting too far back versus this is the wedge. And you know it's a wedge because without me even trying to lift it, the lighter weight, picks up off the floor and the bar stays right on top of my center of gravity. So 
we'll progress this upward. I'm pretty sure, you know, we'll maybe hit a single or so in the lower 600s. I'm starting the American Pro Prep myself, so I'm kind of deloading a little bit from the 815 I pulled last week. But we'll talk about the sumo, we'll talk about hook grip, and we'll just talk about my general setup. What you'll come to find is too, is that I probably start wider than most people, also because it can kind of externally rotate more than most people. But for anyone, for that matter, you kind of want to find that place where you can maximize your width if you're trying to do more of a traditional sumo pull, maximize your width and then maximize how far you can push your knees out while still making sure that your knees are stacked on top of your other joints, like your ankles. So let's say I didn't have this hip mobility and I tried to go super wide, but I couldn't push my knees out any farther than this. This would be disadvantageous because I wouldn't really be able to wedge my hips in properly. I'm only pushing off the instep of my foot and not having even power going into the floor. So if I didn't have the hip mobility and I need to move in a little bit in order to stack my joints properly, that might be the right call. So that's why it's important that you assess your proportions, your current mobility level, and all these different things is gonna play into your specific sumo stance. Gonna be different than mine, gonna be different than the next guy, but the rules are generally, you wanna get your hips as close to the bar as you can, keep your joints stacked, and keep a upright posture to your best ability. So let's go on through with the, with the workout as I build up to a decently heavy single. And for all my conventional friends that may want to transition into sumo, the problem that I had early on was wanting to extend my hips forward to mentally like lock it out. But when I would extend my hips forward, my knees would go soft, which in competition, as you know, that's a no lift. So now what I've been trying to practice is the ability to, as soon as I wedge my hips in and the bar starts elevating, flex my quads as hard as I can, get my knees locked. From a lot of my friends back home that helped me with this, Derek Thistleweight, Johnny Kaufman, Nabil, Sawyer Klatt, Dawson Windham, it's about getting your knees locked, boom, and then the lockout will follow about half a second after, generally. That's how like Dan Grisby pulls, Jamal, all the top guys, you'll see them slam their knees shut, and then their hips come through about half a second later versus like trying to get your hips through first, but you never got those legs locked and you're finishing with soft knees, which can be problematic as far as like pressure on the knees, but also it's gonna be a no lift in competition. Also, shout out to these shin guards, the shin saver from Mark Bell Slingshot. For sumo in particular, I don't even know why, but it's really the only form of deadlift that's ever cut up my shins consistently. Like before I got these, I had the same cut on my shin for like 10 weeks because I kept reopening the cut. And jujitsu, that sucks because I keep having to tape it so it doesn't get affected. So the shin savers are a great tool because they cover the shin, but they also have some padding that prevents like deep cuts from happening. So that's like why I'm really, really glad I invested in these. So if you guys are doing sumo, or even if you cut your shins doing conventional, I highly recommend picking up some of these guys here. So you guys are gonna notice too, I'm electing to do hook grip. And I would say that if you have the choice or if you're able to do hook grip and learn it, that's gonna be the best form of grip for the sumo, just because it generally will allow you to get about like an inch or so more upright, cut off about an inch of range of motion, which generally means you're able to wedge your hips in about an inch closer to the bar if you have the hip mobility to do so. So with the over under grip, a lot of times because of the pronation here, you're forced to kind of tighten up your lats whether or not you're really trying to, versus if I go hook and double over, I can push my shoulders down a little bit more, let the weight sag in my fingers, and this inch alone may not seem like much, but when you're dealing with 95% or more of your max, it'll make a huge difference, and you'll notice it too when you're really trying to be patient off the floor. So, two things right off the bat. One, if you're willing to grow your thumbnails out, that's generally what a lot of power lifters will do so that the hook grip doesn't like rip their thumb skin off at the top. I unfortunately do jujitsu, so I don't have that luxury, but if you don't and you grow your thumbnail out like past the skin or like right, it kind of acts as a guard. So that's one tip. 
The other tip is, um, a lot of times when people try hook grip, they go about chalking themselves like you would regular, regular, like say for over under. This is important, but you also wanna really make sure you're chalking the top of your thumb as well as the tip of your middle finger here where everything's gonna wrap over the top here. So generally when I'm chalking for hook grip, I'll give my thumb a hand job on both sides, just like so. And then I'll make sure that the tips of my fingers more than anything are chalked so that the friction lasts while I'm pulling heavier weight. Now, when we go over to the bar, my journey with hook grip was I would initially shove my hand in as hard as I could and wrap and grab really hard. And my hand will look something like this. That takes much more conditioning of the skin to get used to for one, but also inevitably at a certain point, you're almost guaranteed to rip the skin off no matter how conditioned your skin is. Just because when you shove the bar so deep, it's much more likely to basically roll on, on the skin of your thumb as you're going up. And that's what essentially rips the skin off. When I went for 800 for the first time conventional, that's, that it took my skin off like automatically because I was just shoving it down super, super deep like this and just wrapping really hard. I saw a Johnny Candido, Sean Noriega video where they talk about essentially trying to not grip it hard, relaxing your hands and just trusting the friction that the hook creates. And what I mean by that is when I go down to the bar, you'll see but I only really put the tip of my thumb underneath where there's padding and it's away from the joint here and it's away from the more sensitive skin. So just on the very tip, just like so. And then I wrap and then the rest of my fingers come on top like so. And what that does is it allows the bar to rest on the padding of my thumb, but because it is at the very end and my hands are loose, there's no reason for that bar to roll because it's just pulling down. And it's that friction that the bar creates pushing into my thumb and pushing into the top of my finger here that allows the bar to stay regardless of how heavy it is. It's one of those things that I've built up confidence over time because at first I was like, oh, I'm not grabbing really hard. I need to grip it harder. But as I've gotten more conditioned to it, I've really learned that relaxing your hands for the hook grip, letting the bar pull down on your fingers, which you'll see here shortly, is the way to go. So check this out. So you'll see me feed my hands down to the bar only as much as I need to. Then I wrap, generally middle finger first. And what I kind of do is I'll do like a couple like practice pulls, just to feel where it's at on my thumb. That allows me to kind of adjust before I actually commit to the pull. Now once I'm here and I'm wrapped and I feel like it's good, okay? So now I make sure that the tension stays in my hands. That's when you see my fingers elongate a little bit. Boom, that's the part of me relaxing as opposed to squeezing. So this is relaxing, this is squeezing. And after relaxing my hands and loading the tension in my fingers, now it's a matter of maintaining my current hip height, pushing my hips forward as my knees push out and getting my chest vertical. Watch your toes. One thing with sumo that I've also changed more recently uh, is how I get my brace. So I still brace just like anyone else would where you're trying to maximize the pressure in your diaphragm here by only expanding at the stomach as opposed to taking air in through the chest. But I've actually shortened my air a little bit where I'm really only using my, my nose, so nasal breathing, to expand my belly just enough to feel that pressure in the belt, but not getting like a ton of air that I typically would do for a squat or even conventional where I'm like really breathing in and trying to clench down. I found like taking a more relaxed breath, a shorter breath allows for enough pressure, but it's not so tight that I can't wedge my hips in properly. That's actually why a lot of successful sumo pullers like Yuri Belkin, I even have a friend back home that's really good beltless, but they choose to not use a belt because they feel like the pressure of the belt and the tightness prevents them from getting in good position with the sumo. I still prefer the belt, but I also use a much lighter breath to complement and allow myself to get in proper position. So it'll be very slight, but you just see me take a little bit through my nose here and lock it in here. And I'm keeping my ribs stacked, especially as I go down towards the bar. The preset of your brace is so important. And I'm sure you heard Mark talk about it all the time, but it's just a matter of making sure that your brace creates intra abdominal pressure. So internal pressure of, of the abdomen and the core and holding that in a position that allows your ribs to stack versus being in anterior pelvic tilt and trying to expand your core, you'll still feel pressure, but you, it'll be hard to maintain that position with your lower body, which at the very least will help you avoid injury, but for the heavier lifts will help you maintain position.
Another element here, I'm going over pretty much everything, but just like a conventional, you want the bar to start basically cutting your foot in half. If you start too close to the bar, it'll be hard to wedge your hips in over your center of gravity and there's a good chance you'll start over. So I'll start with the bar cutting my foot in half, but since I'm turning out like sumo, the half of my foot will be more like this in this direction as opposed to more straight on like a conventional like that. The last thing I'll talk about before I pull it is the triple connection that I have between my big toe, my pinky toe, and my heel, and how the connection of all those are important to make sure that the lift itself is getting assistance, not, for my, not just for my posterior chain, but also for my quads too. A lot of times I'll see people, because they wanna push their knees out a lot, they'll sit back, and because of that, their big toe will start lifting off the floor, which is generally when you see people either fall back entirely, or again, we'll get into that soft lockout because their quads never had that big toe connection to actually activate and lock out. So as much as it's important for a squat or a conventional deadlift, when I'm down here at the bottom, I'm driving my big toe into the ground, I'm driving my pinky toe in, and my heel's obviously connected. So everything's even and proportional as far as my weight distribution goes. So here we go, short breath. Now that the weight's a little bit heavier, we got 485 on the bar. The thing to really look for here is how I'm gonna not necessarily purposely pull slower, but implement the patience that I talked about earlier in the video. So naturally, it might take a second or two to come off the floor, even though it's only 580, 485, but that's essentially what I'm talking about. And just the other day, I watched a Stephanie, Steffi Cohen video when she was in powerlifting, and she talked about when you wedge your hips in, and you get in position, there's like this charge of power that occurs at the bottom. Where conventional, if I get in position, I'm just trying to rip it off the floor and make everything come up at once. What she talked about is, and I've felt it now, having deadlifted heavier in this position, is like, you get in position and there's like this, this video, video game-esque type of charge up, where you wedge your hips in, you get in position, and you're here. Now I'm gonna start pushing a little bit. Push, 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 push. And now maybe a second or two in, then I start pushing a little bit harder. Now everything starts coming up and then that lockout becomes quick. I would say generally speaking, um, for most people, especially if you're doing a stance similar to mine, if your lockout is the slowest part and you're fast off the ground, then it's probably a positioning issue. And again, I can't reiterate this enough. Speed off the ground for sumo, for most people, probably means that you didn't wedge your hips in, which is why you're getting a lot of quad and back pop off the floor. But despite all that, your hips are so far away from the bar. And because of the wider stance, you're not really in a position to get your, your feet underneath you and finish. It's gonna be hard for you to lock that out. So really a clean sumo, a technical sumo is patient, slow, slow, and then boom, lock like that. So most people you'll see, they'll, they'll fail off the floor. It'll stick them for maybe like a second too long. So. All right, here we go. Like so. <clears throat> so 595 on the bar here, there's five reds without the collars. Competition wise, Obviously it's beneficial to use the kilo plates because that's specifically what they use in competition. But let's say you're an IG lifter like me and you really want to like get a good solid deadlift bar, pound plate pull, taking some time to use the more condensed, stiffer variation of the deadlift, for me has always carried through really well. Like whenever I've dedicated a couple months to just doing stiff bar work with kilo plates and then like switching to a deadlift bar like a kabuki bar with pound plates, <clears throat> which is generally gonna be wider and distributes the weight further, makes the lift like so much easier. So that's, again, like if you wanna be an IG lifter and get some cloud, that's, that's the best way to go about it. Or if you just wanna hit a nice gym PR, that's also a nice way to go about it as well. So, but again, what you'll notice here, if you play a clip of the 815 pull on the deadlift bar with pound plates, you'll see each individual plate lift off the ground. And by the time the last plate lifts off the ground, maybe a cumulative like two or so seconds off the floor. For this, because it's condensed, it's a stiff bar, 
Everything's gonna come off the ground respectively at the same time, but probably about the same time it took to break the pound plates off the floor with the deadlift bar. It's just now because I have to charge up that energy to break the inertia off the floor with the bar, it'll take the same amount of time, but everything will just kind of come up at once. So here we go. Like so. So what I'm looking for specifically, like if we take a look here, that's why angles are important. Um, I look to make sure that my hip height at the start of the video, like where I'm at now getting my grip, I wanna make sure that stays relatively the same. So when you see me wedge my hips in position, you don't see me drop my hips as much as you do see me just bring them closer to the bar. Because of the fact that the bar is stiff, naturally my hips will probably drop a little bit lower than they would on a deadlift bar that I can actually get bent out of. But we're looking for a consistent positioning of the hips, the quads lock shortly before the lockout happens. And then naturally, as we talked about, I'll zoom in, see that, that triangle that we talked about. So if I could get that triangle even smaller by externally rotating my hips more, that's gonna be more so a mobility thing, but get that smaller, then I'll have a more upright starting position which then means my back has to do less extension to finish, which is not doing very much right now. But again, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do sumo and cheat it, you might as well cheat it to his mass capacity. Start, start, start as upright as possible here. And another thing, you'll see me start, like my hips will come straight through. Like I'm not overextending. I'm trying to really shorten the range of motion as much as I can. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of the sumo. So I'll, I'll give you an example of my arms here. So if I just really focus on slamming my knees shut and then bringing my hips to my hands, this is still a full lockout. My legs are locked, my hips are locked through, but a lot of times you'll see uh, people, which isn't necessarily wrong, but again, you, they come here, they'll get the lockout, but then they'll hyper extend their hips forward, which will be a clean lifting competition. But you'll see, like look at my arms here when I do so, they raise probably about like an inch, inch and a half. So I'd rather cut the range of motion to where the second my hips don't need to go any farther through, that's where they stop. And my hands always end about right here. So as far as maximizing leverage goes, this is where the lift ends for me. Whereas a lot of people, again, try to like over exaggerate that lockout, but then their hands have to raise a little bit. So it's just kind of developing motor patterns and, and practicing like exactly how you want it to look in competition. And then in your practice reps like this, because all this is essentially just practice, finishing it exactly how you plan to finish it in a competition. Yeah, this is dramatically harder than the Kabuki bar, at least for me at this point in time without having too much practice. But that's where I have a lot of respect and just in disbelief of a lot of people's strength. Like say in the USAPL, you got people like SSJ Bob and Ashton Rushka, people like that, that I look up to a lot, that are doing more than I did on the Kabuki bar, uh, but with the stiff bar. And if you really like see the difference, like this isn't gonna be an easy pull by any means, but you'll see like how different it is when you're starting at a much lower point and you're having to lift all the weights up at one time, acknowledging that your, your quads aren't really in a position to assist you a lot off the floor. Again, coming off the floor, is definitely the quads pushing, but they don't have that forward knee travel that you have with conventional. So generally it's a slower start. Your back is also not in a position to kind of muscle things up too. That's why it's such a technical lift. That's why the hip wedge that we're talking about and the patience at the beginning is so important is because if you don't have those elements, you might like be able to get it off the floor a little bit, but the positioning that you then have to correct after the fact is gonna be damn near impossible, so. like that yeah you have to really be willing to invest that time there at the bottom and that's where even even me knowing what I'm telling you guys I still don't trust it because again with conventional like you, if you pull up some of my old clips just I like my ego is driven off off of speed off the floor so like if that was conventional and I was going for that I would have gave up probably halfway through you know but for this it's like 
it's there, it's there, it's there. Like Steffi Cohen says, the power's charging up, charging up, charging up. And then the weights just kind of levitate off the floor again after you you invest that two, three seconds. And as you saw in the video, when it came off the floor, it moved pretty smooth. You know, and if, if I really want to be stupid today, I could probably give 700 a run, but no point to do so. But at the same time too, like 700 would be hell off the floor. And then it would just kind of pop up. Like a lot of her videos back when she was powerlifting, she was deadlifting five times her body weight. She spent two, three, I think I saw one video, it seemed like four seconds almost off the floor and then, and then it comes up. And so that's just building the confidence, knowing that the strength is there, but you have to be able to express that strength through patience, through that wedge. That's the key to sumo that I'm still trying to perfect and you guys can work on at home. Okay guys, so that concludes our sumo deadlift tutorial. I hope you got as much out of it as I did when I first learned all these cues. If you guys wanna continue following my journey, learn more about cheating your deadlift and see some jujitsu in the meantime, make sure to follow me at jhouse182 on Instagram, or you could check out my YouTube at Jimmy House. Thanks guys.